welcome to my Iceland bikepacking rig breakdown video. If you're new here, I made a film recently about my trip in the summer of 2022 that I took to Iceland with my friend Michael. If you haven't seen that film yet, I'm gonna link it in the description. And in this video, I'm going to be breaking down my entire bikepacking rig, the clothes I brought, the bags I had on my bike, the tires, the any questions you may have about bikepacking. If you're interested in going to Iceland or just interested in getting into bikepacking, I'm hoping to answer any of those questions for you here today. I'm gonna to be linking some chapters below so you can skip ahead if you're interested in a specific section of the video, but I'm going to try to lay this out in a very logical and concise way so you can get all the information you need but not be bored to death. With that said, let's get started with the bike. In Iceland, I ran a Cannondale Topstone gravel bike and I ran 700C wheels with 38 millimeter Gravel King tires. I was really happy with the setup. These are pretty fast rolling tires, but I knew that we'd be doing some gravel because in Iceland, as soon as you get off the main road, it's pretty gnarly gravel. So I wanted something that had a little bit more give than just a standard road tire. Michael ran 40 millimeter Maxxis receptors and he really enjoyed those tires as well. We both ran tubeless, which I think was a really good decision, especially with the mileage that we were doing and just doing some off-road stuff. I think if we went strictly road, we probably could have gotten away with just doing tubed, but we decided to go tubeless and it was perfect. We had no mechanicals, we had no issues with any of the bikes. We did each have a mini pump with us to help fill up tires if we were losing some air. And we actually did find a CO2 cartridge at the airport at the bike pit that someone kindly left behind. So we did have a CO2 cartridge just in case one of the beads on the tires got loose and we just had to fill up the tires. We both ended up running Ergon saddles and they're both really comfortable, but in the end, if you're riding for 11, 12 hours a day, you're gonna have a sore butt either way. In the front, I was running a SP7 series front dynamo hub to charge everything. I did end up running a front rack. It's called a Hyacinth front rack. These are made in Ukraine. I ended up having to customize this actually in this support here on the, on the front. I had to customize, I had to take a steel rod and hammer it to make it fit right here because the one that comes with the rack is too short because the top stone only has two bolt-ons right here for cargo in the front. If I had a third one right here, I probably could have made it work, but I had to customize this support here. But the rack is great. I was able to have my sleep system here, half of the tent and some other accessories. I don't think I would have been able to fit without a front rack, so I was really happy to run one. Michael did not run one for his bike, but he didn't have as much camera equipment as I did. And then in the front, I also had some tail fin medium-sized cargo cages, and these had um, two Sea to Summit uh, dry bags with the volley straps, and th this was all the food in the cook kit, which I'll be getting into later in the video. As for frame protection, I did wrap most of my bike in helicopter tape, which is just a thicker tape to protect the frame from rocks and also like where the straps connect to the frame. And on the bike, I'm running full ass savers bike fenders because I knew that it would be raining a lot in Iceland. And even when it's not raining, the roads are still wet. The fenders really helped keep my gear looking neater because it was just keeping the dirt and the rain off and also it kept my shoes drier because it, I wasn't getting spray from the front wheel. So that was really, really great. So I highly recommend you deck out your bike with fenders front and rear if you're going to Iceland. For bike bags, I was running mostly Revelate bike bags. So from front to rear, I had some Seat to Summit bags here. These are the lightweight ones. This is the inside of the tent. I had an Event dry bag for my sleeping bag and the pad and pillow and everything like that. And then I have a Mount Hardware roadside waste pack and this had my drone in it, which is really nice because if we were getting off the bike, I could just take off the bag, sling it across my body and it was perfect. And then I had a little seat cushion here, which I honestly never used. I think I used it maybe one time on the trip, but it's foam, so it doesn't really take up any weight. It was just a space thing and then I have a an oveja negra front bag here that was really great for the first aid kit and just some extra bars and stuff like that I custom made some feed bags in the front here so these are actually black diamond chalk bags for climbing but I sewed on two velcro straps so I could attach it to the front these chalk bags are $15 each and feed bags are like 50 to $60 so it's considerably cheaper and it's kind of nice to have something DIY on the bike. It makes it more special. For the front bag, I have a Revelate Designs mag tank. That's the bolt-on version because I have bolt-on mounts in my 
Canon Del Frame. And then I have the full frame back from Revelate. This is great. I have the Revelate Jerry Can that's right by my seat post that had some extra tools in it for quick access. And then in the back, I have the 16 liter spine lock bag, which I think is quite honestly the best bag on the market. I think the way that that metal pin goes through and just completely eliminates any sway in the back is fantastic. And they have this really nice hard plastic on the bottom to keep you know dirt and rain off the bag as well. And then on the down tube, I did have an extra cargo bottle and that had some extra inner tubes, some chain cleaning stuff. I had some rag, a little toothbrush for the chain and everything like that. And that was nicely tucked away. I didn't really use any of that on the trip. We did use chain lube obviously, but we didn't have any mechanicals or any punctures. So all that luckily was not open on the trip, which I was really, really happy about because I did not want to go from tubeless to tubed. For my sleep system, I'm running a Marmot Trussell's 20 degree synthetic bag. This bag is a little bit older and the insulation is a little bit more compacted. So it's more like a 30 to 35 degree bag now. I would say this bag was okay for most of the time. There were a couple nights it was a little bit colder when it was windy and rainy and I did feel a little bit cold, but overall the bag was great. And then I was rocking an insulated climate normal with sleeping pad. And also I was rocking a climate inflatable pillow also, it's super important in Iceland in summer to bring a sleeping mask and some earplugs. Earplugs if your partner is a snorer, aka that was me on the trip, unfortunately. Sorry, Michael. And the sleeping mask is really important because the sun sets at like 11.30 at night and it gets up at like 3.30 in the morning. So there's only about four hours of darkness each night. So I'd highly recommend a sleeping mask because then you can sleep in until like six or seven or eight in the morning or whenever you wake up and you're not waking up to a super bright tent. All right, for food storage, I had everything in the front. I have two heavy duty, big river, sea to summit, five liter dry bags in the front. I got them in yellow, so it's a little bit more visible on the bike. And again, I was using the tail fin medium sized cargo racks to mount them. And I was using some volley straps to strap the bags to the front. This worked really, really well. And honestly, the 10 liters of capacity was perfect. In one of the sides, I had my Stanley cup, which had my mug, my stove, my, my knife that I used for eating. I had a titanium spork. Everything was just in there nice and tucked away and there's still some room in there to put some other food essentials. So like I put everything that I would need a stove for on that stove side and then everything on the other side was more like quick, easy eating stuff like during the day. So next to my stove, I'd have like ramen, some instant pasta. We had some rice meals and stuff like that and some oatmeal. And then on the other side, we had some like bars and chips and other stuff like that that we could just eat during the day. And then of course in the feed bags, you know, you have your candy and all that other foods. All right, so my cook kit was right here. And this is my favorite setup that I've had so far. And luckily everything fits really nicely and tucked away. So I have a titanium spork on the side. I just, this is like a brand called Tokes on Amazon. It's a long handle, which is important because when you're, when you have a tall Stanley and you're making pasta, it's nice to reach all the way to the bottom. Spork is great. This is the only utensil I have besides a knife. And then as you saw earlier, this mug, this is really nice to have a separate cup and this just fits right inside and it just nests like this. And also when, as soon as you put the titanium spork in there, it just doesn't rattle around. So just, it just keeps it nice and snug. And then inside the Stanley, I have small sponge and some soap. I have a lighter for the stove. I have my Openel knife and this is strictly for eating. There's some leftover tea bags here. This is some Earl Grey. I actually prefer to drink tea when I'm camping because I find that I can make tea exactly like I drink it at home versus coffee is usually not, not the same. I'm a big espresso guy. And then the stove that I have is a BRS titanium stove. And this stove is like $15 on Amazon and it's made of titanium. It's super, super small and it boils water very quickly and it doesn't take up very much room. So for hydration in Iceland, I had a water bladder that was in the lower triangle of my center frame bag. And luckily the Reveille bag actually has a little hole where you can run out the Camelback hose. So I had a hose ready to go at my mouth whenever I needed to drink. And I also had two collapsible bottles made by Hydrapack. I had a 500 milliliter and a one liter bottle. And I also brought a Katadin B-Free water filter that fit perfectly with the one liter bottle. 
just in case we're not super sure about some water sources. But in the end, all the water is really clear. We actually didn't even use the filter on the trip. The three liter bladder in the center of the frame pack was perfect. And I don't regret not bringing a real water bottle at all. All right, next is the clothing. The clothing is a very personal decision that you have to make for yourself. I think it's important to understand what temperature you run at while you're cycling. This temperature range that we were cycling in was right in the middle between getting too hot and too cold, and it kind of depended on which way the wind was blowing. It was a tailwind, headwind, if we're climbing or if we're, you know, we're in a flat section. It's really important to bring clothes that you can layer. You can wear them together. They fit together, and make sure you don't bring clothes that really only have one function. For example, I made the decision to bring two short bibs and bring a pair of leg warmers instead of bring a long pair and a short pair because I suspected that in 50 degrees and over, it would not be cold enough to wear the long bibs and I'd be way too hot and they would be taking up a bunch of space in my bag and I would never use it. So here are the temperatures that we encountered on our trip. So the trip dates were July 27th to August 10th and the daytime temperature ranges range between nine degrees Celsius or 48 degrees Fahrenheit to 16 degrees Celsius or 60 degrees Fahrenheit. At nighttime, it was a little bit cooler, but still very consistent. It was about five degrees Celsius and 41 degrees Fahrenheit and 10 degrees Celsius or 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Some of the nights were very, very warm and I didn't even have my sleeping bag zipped up and other nights were very cold, depending on what kind of storm system was moving through and what kind of wind was blowing. For the jacket, I brought a Mountain Hardware Exposure 2 Gore-Tex jacket. This jacket was absolutely perfect. It was a really, really great rain layer. I've had this jacket for a few years now and it's still waterproof. I love the pit zips on it and I love the hood. So this is technically a climbing jacket and it actually fits completely over my helmet, which is really, really nice when it was just torrential downpour and I wanted to keep my head dry. After a while in the rain, I just kind of gave up and let my head be wet, but it's really nice to have the option of putting your hood over your helmet. The next new jacket that I actually added right before the trip was the new Mount Hardware Core Air Shell jacket. So this jacket is super lightweight. It's more of a windbreaker rather than an actual rain jacket. It is absolutely not waterproof, but it was really nice to put on a base layer, put that jacket on and then put my rain jacket over it. So this really was great at keeping the wind off and when it was a sunny day, it was nice to keep it on and being able to zip it up and down to work on my moisture management so I'm not sweating too much. Rain pants are something you do not want to forget on this trip and I'm overemphasizing this fact, like please do not go on this trip without rain pants. I brought an Outdoor Research Helium rain pants. These have a full zip on the side which have their pros and cons. The pros were that it was mostly waterproof. The cons were that when it was completely raining sideways, because there's a full zip on the side, the rain actually blew into my pants and there's water dripping down from my knee all the way down into my socks. I don't think it's necessarily the fault of outdoor research. I think material after a while gives into rain no matter what, but the full zip definitely made it easier for the rain to get in. Since then, I've upgraded to a mountain hardware pair of rain pants that don't have a full zip, so I'm hoping for the next trip they won't let in any water. Also, on the topic of rain, you need to get a really good pair of Gore-Tex overshoe covers for rain. I bought the Goreware Wear Gore-Tex overshoe covers. These run about $90 full price. I got them for like 65 on Amazon. I would highly recommend you get a good pair because Michael bought a cheaper pair of Pearl Izumis that are around $30 and his started letting in water after like three hours of riding in the rain on the first day. I would highly recommend you get a really quality pair of rain covers. Mine did not let in any rain, and I think it's partially because of the Gore-Tex fabric. It's just really nice and breathable, and also just completely sheds the rain. It's really important to bring a pair of shoe covers because as soon as your shoes or your socks get wet, chances are in Iceland they're not gonna dry again. For bibs, I ended up bringing two bibs on this trip. They're both by a company called The Black Bibs. I brought a pair of cargo bibs bibs and non-cargo bibs. Honestly, this was one of those things that I probably would have just brought one bib in hindsight because I wore the same bibs for like five or six days straight. I would say if I brought one pair of bibs, it would definitely be a cargo bib because it was really nice to just store the GoPro in my side pocket or put wrappers or anything like that. I also brought a pair of the black bibs leg warmers and this was a specific decision to bring leg warmers separate from a full set of thermal bibs because I wanted to bring clothes that have multiple uses. So the leg warmers could easily be worn under my joggers if I'm in camp and I'm feeling cold or worn to sleep and it was really nice to have an extra layer on and I actually wore them a few times on the bike when we just had a really nasty headwind and it was raining and it was cold so it was really nice to have an extra layer that I could put on under the rain pants and not get too cold on the bike. So I brought one of the 250 weight smart wool long sleeve shirts. These 
These are the thicker thermals that they make. And I brought a pair of the 150 long sleeve shirts that are the thinner kind, which are more like a normal t-shirt. And I brought two of the lighter weight regular t-shirts. And this is more of just for layering again, just in case it was a warmer day, I could bring you know, t-shirt, I could wear my mid-layer jacket and then my rain jacket on the outside. For socks, I brought four smart wool socks to cycle in and this way I could just rotate them. And I brought one t-shirt to sleep in and a pair of boxers to sleep in. Honestly, this was complete waste of space. I really wish I just didn't even bring this at all. I thought I'd be, you know, really grossed out with my clothes that I'm wearing during the, during the day and it'd be nice to wear a clean t-shirt to sleep at night, but I didn't really care. And the smart wool gear honestly doesn't stink at all. Like even after five days of wearing it every single day and sweating in it, it just doesn't stink. It's the material. I'd highly recommend you bring wool because it dries very fast, it doesn't stink, and it's significantly better than cotton. I also brought some Lululemon Surge joggers for off the bike, and these are great because they totally keep the wind out, but they're very, very thin and light. And I could wear them potentially with the leg warmers underneath if I was feeling cold. And I also brought a pair of smart wool long underwear to layer underneath my Surge joggers, and this is what I slept in pretty much every night in my sleeping bag. I also wore the Physique X5 Terra gravel shoes, and I brought a pair of rubber burr Birkenstocks to wear off the bike. The Birkenstocks had multiple functions. One, they don't weigh anything. Two, I can shower in them. So if I'm in a campground and the floor is kind of gross, I can just wear the rubber Birkenstocks to shower in. And also it's just a great camp shoe. If your shoes are really tight during the day, like cycling shoes typically are, it's really nice to have just a pair of like sandals that you can just wear and your feet can spread out and get a little bit of a break at night. I also brought a baseball hat for off the bike that I just hung off the front. And I also brought two glasses on this trip, which in hindsight, I would have just brought one. I brought the Oakley flight jackets with some tinted lenses and I have the Oakley Sutros with clears for night, night riding or rain riding. And Michael actually had just one pair of sunglasses with photochromatic transition lenses. And next time I'm just bringing one of those because his lenses were absolutely great. They transitioned from cloudy to sunny perfectly. And it's just nice to just have one pair of glasses and not worry about the second pair falling off the bike or something. So I did run a Dynamo front hub system and I'm going to make a more in-depth video about how I wired everything and how the charging worked. This was a topic that was a big mystery to me for a very long time. And it took me like four months of research to figure out like what wires I need and the wiring harnesses and the lights and what works and what doesn't. I believe all in it cost me around $700 and that includes the front Dynamo hub and the wheel and the wires and the lights and everything like that. Very quickly, I have the SP7 series front Dynamo I have the K-Lite wiring harness with the little switch on it. I have the Sinewave Cycles USB charger that's also waterproof, and this is perfect for charging my gear. And then I also have two lights from Supernova. The front light is the E3 Pro 2 front light, and then I have the E3 tail light on the rear. For camera equipment, it was really important to me to bring compact gear that's very high quality and I'm able to document the trip in a very nice way, but it doesn't interfere with the trip. So I brought a GoPro Hero 8, which was great for shooting in the rain because it's waterproof. I brought a Sony ZV-1, which has a great zoom on it and it has great autofocus and it's mainly made for vlogging. Also important is that it has a zoom on it. So it's a 24 to 70 zoom equivalent on the lens, which is really important to me to zoom in and get some detail shots when I wanted to. I also got a brand new drone for this trip, which is the brand new DJI Mini 3 Pro, or I was brand new at the time. This drone is great. It charges off of USB-C. It charges very quickly. The flight time is insane. The wind resistance is really, really good as well. And it was really great to just be able to charge everything off the bike and I'm able to put the bird up in the air and fly and then land it and then keep going. The batteries last about 30 minutes and I was actually able to ration my batteries to do like about three 10 minute flights per battery. And it was really great to go like two, three, four days of riding and not have to charge up the batteries every single day because I'm able to ration the batteries and fly a little bit more. I got my drone shots while riding using a trick that Rides of Japan, which is a YouTube channel I just highly recommend you check out. He made a video in 2019 about how to modify a DJI remote controller to use a GoPro mount to mount to your handlebars. And this was a really, really neat trick on the trip because I knew that I wanted to ride and film at the same time. It was really great to just slide in the remote. It's nice and secure and I can see what I'm filming and just ride one handed and have my other hand playing with the joystick and flying around us. So it was really nice.
All right, for tools, I stored most of my tools in either the Revelate Designs jerry can, which is right by my seat post, or I had it in the down tube cargo bottle. I brought two extra spare tubes on the trip. Uh, again, I had some like toothbrushes. I brought chain lube on the trip as well and just some racks for cleaning the chain. Brought some master links. I have a wolf tooth components master link tool. I brought two Crank Brothers tools, one with a chain breaking function. So in case we had any issues with our chain, I could break the chain and change out the master links. And then I brought a Leatherman Skella tool, which actually is my favorite multi-tool that I've ever bought because it has all the features that you need and none of the ones that you don't. For navigation, I used a Wahoo Element Rome version one. I know a new one has since come out since my trip, but the version one is still really great. I planned all of our routes through Strava and using also Google Maps Street View just to see what the roads are like. And I also took inspiration from some people's blog posts and YouTube videos. At the beginning of the trip, the navigation was not working at all because I totally forgot to download Iceland onto the Wahoo Element Rome. I would highly recommend you do this at home before the trip because it's a little bit tricky. So you have to connect your phone to Wi-Fi and your Wahoo Element Rome to Wi-Fi as well. If you're working with some really crappy gas station Wi-Fi, it's just not gonna be very fast. I think the whole map for Iceland is like 25 megabytes, but it took us like an hour to download it because I just wasn't able to connect it to the Wi-Fi and it just took too long. So the bike bit at the Keflavik International Airport is perfect. I don't know if you've seen any pictures or videos of this place, but it is absolute bike heaven. You walk out of the airport, you can unpack your bike, and there's two bike stands that are waiting for you with all the tools hanging from it, and you practically don't even need to get your multi-tools out because all the tools are there ready to go. As for bike bag storage, we ended up storing our bike bags at a local car rental place and they charged us 160 US dollars for 12 days of storage, which is actually much cheaper than any kind of bike luggage locker. This was a big question mark for us going into the trip and we had actually no plan on what we were gonna do because I wasn't able to find any information about what others have done in the past. And a big concern too is we are both flying with Evoc bike bags, which are foldable, but you can't get rid of the overall length of it because the bottom of it is rigid and it's made of metal. So you can't fit it into the standard storage locker. So what I would recommend is don't worry, just walk around the parking lot outside the airport. There's multiple car rental places and just go to their office and just let them know like, hey, I would like to store my bike bag here for the duration of the trip. How much is it gonna cost? All right, so that's everything. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you have any more questions, please leave a comment below. I'd love to answer them. And if you haven't watched the film yet, please watch the film. It's gonna be linked in the description below as well. Thank you so much for watching.